In this video, we'll be doing an oil change on a Lincoln MKZ with the 2 liter turbocharged 4 cylinder engine. Be sure to watch this video the whole way through as there's a lot of specificities for how you jack this car up. An interlocking gym mat will help you not bruise your knees. Fortunately, Lincoln has made this car DIY friendly in terms of jack stands and using floor jacks. Ford makes their cars with good steel. So based on my experience, I'm going to tell you that you can put jack stands on separate areas. But I'm also going to go through the safest way to do this without damaging the car. So let's go underneath the front door here. Alright, so that long strip of metal in the center of the screen is slightly reinforced, which is where you want to put your floor jack. See this spot here with the little circle? That's a subframe part, and I checked all the steel. It's very thick. You can also put your floor jack there. Now, when I say DIY friendly, just a little bit further down here you can see this cutout in the side skirt they've put that so that you can put another jack stand for safety there now I will see what the most efficient route is sorry about the lighting there but this car is definitely floor jackable the only thing you need to be really careful of here is this side skirt is a very odd shape and it's very low so based on what type of floor jack you have you're going to want to make sure your floor jack does not press up against this, bruise it, or crack it. So use what you have there, but there's a lot of space to put jack stands and floor jacks on both sides of the front of this car. Never rest the car on the floor jack, and if you are going to do it, have safety jack stands in place and chalk the rear wheels. So you want a properly weighted floor jack, just one is enough. You want a drain pan, as you see on the left there, that has at least 5.4 liters capacity. Based on Amsoil's website, which is a very good resource I use for oil, is 5.4 liters is the oil capacity, including the filter on this vehicle. If you want to pre-fill the filter, you can. You don't have to. It's not that crucial. But 5.4 liters is the amount of oil that you should have. Filter strap wrenches, I never use them. I always bring them, though these teeth filter wrenches are always the best because they allow you multiple angles from what I've seen it's very easy to take the filter off on this car you're gonna want a number 15 socket for the drain plug and a half inch ratchet with the reducer or just a standard 3 8 ratchet will do as well now the thing is we're gonna find out when I go underneath but the drain plug on this car from other videos I've seen does not have a drain plug washer and everything is supposedly aluminum so based on Amsoil's website as well the drain plug torque is only 20 pound feet usually on cars it's between 30 to 33 which leads me to believe that yes this is a much softer setup and you want to be really careful not to strip that drain pan side of the oil drain plug you don't need a fancy setup like this, I just grabbed this from the garage, but a 10 millimeter to zip off the under tray bolts. You can have a can of brake cleaner just to clean up any spill that you have around the drain plug so that you can monitor leaks afterwards. A short piece of cheater bar in case the drain plug is on there tight. Do not ever use this to put it back on. You should use a torque wrench, 20 pound feet, but I just snug it because I have experience with these things. You want a funnel to fill your oil. I always bring some flathead screwdrivers just in case I find something weird under the car. I'm going to use a drill with the adapter and a 10 mil to zip out the bolts quicker. You're going to want at least two to three rags, one for cleanup, and you also want a relatively clean rag to spin on the new filter. And you're going to tighten it with your full body force. Don't put any kind of a wrench on it. That's more than enough but the rag is there to give you grip because your hands and gloves are all going to have oil on them. And some nitrile gloves always help in oil change jobs to keep things clean. I have four jack stands with me to put two in as safeties possibly, but you really only need two to rest the car on while you do this job. I've got two interlock bricks to chalk the rear wheel so that the vehicle doesn't roll away. We are going to be using this Castrol filter 
Almost any brand 3614 filter will work. Use a quality oil filter on a turbocharged car. You can also get the OE one from Ford Lincoln as well. In terms of motor oil, we're using the 5W30 full synthetic on this car. If you plan on keeping the car, I don't know if I'll be doing another oil change on this. You want to buy two big jugs because it'll be a hair of savings over time. But this will do for this because it's 5.4 liters as per AMS oil and we have six liters here. Stay tuned to the end of the video. Uh, the owner claims that there is some kind of a issue with the washer fluid system. So I'm just going to try filling it up first, but that might be diagnosis and fixing for another video. You can see I have a waste oil that I've started washer fluid here. I like to put my waste oil on these because you can keep whatever's left in your oil jug and it makes for easy identification when you go to take this to a waste disposal place. Now I'm here in a parking lot but if you're at home you definitely want to put cardboard down in case you have spills and just use your funnel and your cardboard drag it all out together you can see this in my other oil change videos to have a really clean finish if you're doing it at home. So the most important thing in any oil change is that gasket on the oil filter you got to make sure you get the old one off if it's stuck to the housing lube the gasket with some fresh motor oil and put it on okay if you're gonna fill it up halfway subtract that from what you're going to put into the car but if you don't get that gasket off you will have a nasty oil leak and seeing that most people are gonna be lazy that under tray you're gonna put it back before you start the car but the technically correct way To do a job on a car with a belly pan is to drop the car, take it to level ground, check everything, then come back, jack it up again, and then put the under tray back on once you've confirmed that there's no leaks from the oil filter or the drain plug. But most people do not do that. This car is on a slight incline right now, so I'm going to do the oil change. I'm going to start it up because I have experience. But for my final check, this vehicle will not be checked here. I will take it to a place with level ground. Always remember that. The oil is right on top of the engine cover. Very convenient with the dipstick. Now, if you have a more conventional floor jack like this, you can just remove that puck on top and make it kind of a low profile floor jack. Here's an as we go point when I said that you got to be really careful of that skirt. This is a low profile floor jack and it does not reach the side member to lift the car without damaging the side skirt. So what you need is a hockey puck or a small block of two by four, one or two of them in order to safely do this without damaging the car. Even if you take it further into the subframe mount, it's still going to catch onto the side skirt. Now, I don't have any of those sort of things with me, so I'm gonna have to resort to using the interlock bricks of my wheel chocks. If you're gonna do this, use a flat brick. These are textured bricks. Don't use bricks at all, okay? But I have enough experience that I can do this. Block of wood is the correct thing to use because the bricks can chip off the paint and possibly cause rust, but if you're really gentle, you can get away with it. So not recommending what I do. Actually, see here's the one advantage of being in a homeless parking lot doing this kind of stuff. We have garbage. So we have a piece of wood here that I'm going to break up and use as my uh, hockey puck spacer to do this job. On second thought, some brilliant people have burned this thing, so that's going to crumble. I cannot use that. I got to do a little bit of homeless searching myself now. See you in a bit. All right, so thanks to the littering public, we have some very good blocks actually that I'm going to keep. And this one with about the four inch rise on it seems to be the best for the job so this is actually very good little piece of wood couple two by fours will do but definitely do this make sure the e-brake is set while you're doing this and you put your bricks to chalk the wheels even a piece of wood of that size fits very well in the slots that Lincoln has left as pre-grooved for such a purpose and we're just gonna put jack stands a little bit further down I'm pretty sure the weight distribution of this car is good enough that we can put jack stands there. So we will try this. On second thought, we will not try this. And here's a lesson for the importance of having a uh, fresh piece of wood to do this. 
the lighting isn't very good but you're gonna have to take my word that that piece of wood had a bunch of cracks in it and as I'm putting it up it's putting force down on that piece of wood and there's a high chance that it could crack and drop the car back down you see I still have the car on the ground before when it, once I heard the cracks so we're gonna lower it and we're gonna use a stronger piece of wood if I have it here but definitely definitely use some cut pieces of fresh wood for this now the other thing I can tell you because I've worked on a lot of cars is this car is actually quite front heavy okay it's a heavier car than I thought I am NOT going to put those jack stands in the back okay they will just be cosmetic jack stands and I'm gonna use two floor jacks in the front to hold the car up those are just gonna be safeties see the crack on the wood that we were using there this one might not be any better but I gotta get this job done alright so I'm gonna go back on that now that I'm lifting it up with a proper piece of wood the weight does not seem to be overly too much on this car but here's how you're gonna do it because I don't want any of you to damage your cars the rest is your choice you need two floor jacks so I'm gonna use both of my floor jacks okay I am going to put jack stands on that little uh, cutout on the skirt that Lincoln has left there but the weight of the car is going to be just a hair on those jack stands with some tension on the ground so that they're actually stable and they're not going to topple over if the car decides to go backwards which we have a bunch of safeties in in check so we should be fine in that front but the car is going to be resting a hair on the jack stands but the 75 percent of the weight of the car i'm going to leave the floor jacks in engaged mode with their wooden blocks because that's what's going to be holding the car primarily so it's going to be a split between the two so that the weight does not buckle that steel cross member that goes down the side i'm being very safety prone here the steel on this car is definitely strong enough to support it okay the car is not that heavy but this is the way i'm going to do it to play it safe okay all right so once you've got this side up just a bit go to the other side and put your other floor jack so that the car goes up stably if that's even a word and you don't put too much pressure on either frame rail so the e-brake is on and the safeties are in place especially when you're in a parking lot you really got to be careful of all this stuff because you don't know what the gradients of the ground truly are all right so that's the puck you just take it right off now as you can see I've been lifting it slightly from this side and slightly from this side for even weight distribution on the frame now the again like I said use fresh blocks but that same block that I had I ended up using it here because that was a correct good size and I flipped it so that the crack was on the other side which means that this is a stable piece of wood to use now so I'm just gonna lift her up a bit more we're gonna put the jack stands in there and I've already described to you how I'm gonna set the car then we're gonna go underneath all right guys I don't want you to mess up so I'm gonna show you where I'm messing up there's no damage done to the car but you see the block on this side it's nice and minty on its position stand when I tell you gradients of sketchy parking lots or even your driveway are sometimes not ideal I want you to look at this okay this could have to do with the piece of wood but hopefully the lighting can focus on this angle maybe okay you can kind of see it there so it's inside the skirt it hasn't damaged anything but the crack on that piece of wood or even just the gradient of the parking lot is not ideal okay that is not resting you see how I put my fingers in there don't ever do that but I'm just doing it to show you that while it is stable just the slightest bit of a tilt in the ground will mess you up so I'm going to Okay, I have enough experience that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it this low. Okay, I lowered this side a bit. I started going too high and that's where my problem started occurring. So I'm going to do this and I'm actually going to set it down on the jack stand slot right there. Okay. Alright, so I very gently, the slot at the front, you cannot put the jack stand into it because of where the jack is so I put it on one a little bit further back and even as I put it down just a hair I could see it starting to chip the paint and wanting to bend I stopped before that because I had the control on the floor jack but no this is not a DIY skirt cutout friendly car 
okay scrap everything I said before I might edit it out but I'm kind of stuck here with this car okay you know what I have to do and this is something you got to do in terms of safety don't think oil change I want to get it done quickly I have to reposition this whole car I got to find a more flat patch of land relocate all my stuff and start over because this is a much heavier car than I suspected and the slight bit of gradient here is not allowing me to do this job properly all right so the car has been safely lowered one at a time on each side but again the importance of using that block of wood is fine the one on this side and this side lifted fine but that bend you saw there see this older piece of wood that is from the the car's frame rail digging right in so this is a low grade of wood with cracks gotta go find something else and I'm going to move the car now what is the solution here to get this done properly we are going to put it flat I'm gonna jack it up the same way with blocks to avoid damaging the skirt but I'm only going to put cosmetic jack stands this time so it's a bit riskier what I'm doing don't try this at home take it to a shop use a two post floor jack this is no longer a DIY this is just an informational watch what I'm doing kind of video now so now I got to move everything over you see the car over there there's a flat patch of asphalt there we're gonna do it there all right so the lighting is poor underneath the car but from the previous parts of the video I showed you those two subframe points with the small circle there those are actually three layers of stamped steel there so they're definitely going to be strong enough and definitely stronger than the side sill frame uh, cross members that run down the side of the car those are only this is only for a four point uh, ho uh, lift those those side points I'm gonna try to jack it with my little blocks on the subframe points and put some cosmetic jack stands in and we'll see on this more level ground how it goes now I'm not exactly sure the gradient of the ground here so I've chalked one wheel with two bricks on both sides in case something something decides to roll but I will update you once I get the car back up in the air all right so I'm slowly jacking it up from both sides I am slightly tilted this way the way I'm putting the camera the the road surface now the the floor jack on this side on the subframe point I slid in the chalk of wood from the back and I started lifting it a bit on the other side fortunately I did not have to use that damaged piece of wood I couldn't find anything else in this parking lot but fortunately this floor jack was able to hit the subframe mount point and go up very smoothly now I'm gonna lift it up slowly from both sides and we are going to use two floor jacks on each side cosmetically only just touching those frame rails a hair the good thing about using the subframe mount points is that you can place the floor jacks to the reinforced spot that's a little bit closer to where the floor jack is right now so we got the wheels chalked as well and if say one of the floor jacks were to give out which I'm using newer floor jacks you should always use new floor jacks even if it bends those frame rails just a hair if the car were to fall on one side you won't crush your chest and die so this is the best way that I found to do this car now let's get on with it all right so we're safely up in the air our jack stands are just touching the frame rails as close as possible to the front so that they could catch the weight if something were to happen on both sides so now we're gonna take the under tray off all right so going down from the front emblem of the car all right so you can see Lincoln has some kind of a riveted air dam here we're not touching that there's a number of 10 millimeter bolts and these two plastic tabs just use a screwdriver and gently pull them straight down you don't want to break them and get this uh, felt underbelly off absolutely do not have children around so that they can't touch your floor jack handles now with those uh, with these plastic tabs it's very crucial okay because you might think you're gonna twist them but the correct thing to do is to use two flathead screwdrivers throw one in on each side one on the right one on the left and pull straight down with the screwdrivers and then pull the tab out it's very easy to break these all right so there are 11 10 millimeter screws they are all the same length so don't worry about mixing them up those plastic tabs just leave the portion you pulled out a bit attached to it and slowly pull it out 
okay? There's two of these bolts at the back that you might miss at the beginning. Now just on a Lincoln looking underneath here, this looks like some kind of oil slash coolant crust that was underneath this car. So this is something we'll keep an eye on if we uh, continue to go forward with this car working on it. This car only has 97,000 kilometers, so that's a bit worrying of a odd stain, but that could just be something from the road that has worked its way into that German style air dam that this Lincoln tried to do and eventually came back down. So we're not gonna get ahead of ourselves on that. Now underneath, I wanna show you something. Now this car is either a 2019 or a 2020. I'm not sure the VIN 10th digit was not the year on this, so that's kind of weird. But look at this rust that's already on the subframe. This could be from the, like see I'm gonna zoom in here. This is what you'd usually see on like a five to six year old car and this is only probably a three to four year old car. So, I mean, that's, that's a bit weird. But other than that, it's still solid Ford steel, okay? It might not go, uh, actually I don't know what Ford is using nowadays, but look at that. Uh, torque mount there that looks just like the Volvo torque mount that's probably the same part from the same era when Ford and Volvo worked together not the same part but same design okay I'm getting a bit off track there this car has got a nicely placed AC compressor everything is pretty workable on this car that's what I like big car small engine works well even even look at the the, the turbo pipe that looks like a, a P1 Volvo too there's a lot of P1 Volvo looking stuff underneath this car the whole setup because it's an all-wheel drive as well I'm not sure if this one's Haldex or not but this is actually kind of cool as to how wow even look at the control arms they look similar to Volvo stuff from 10-15 years ago too it's just kind of like Dodge using uh, on the newest Hellcats and Chargers Mercedes S-Class technology from the early 2000s which because they're too uh, brainless to design new stuff themselves and the Mercedes stuff was so good back then. I think this is a lot of Volvo componentry still on this car, but okay, we'll maybe look into this car a bit more later. All right, so the drain plug is gonna be right there. We'll see if it's a 15 in a second. And as you can see, the oil filter is very accessible at the very front right here. Before dropping the drain plug and the oil filter, always take the cap off okay just put it on sideways so nothing falls in and remove the dipstick just slightly so that the gasket is not seated this will aid in extra ventilation to drain the oil more smoothly you can run the car earlier this car has been running just for a bit smoother oil flow but that's not necessary all right so the drain plug is a 15 there is no visible drain plug washer on this car and the last oil change for this vehicle was done at Lincoln itself. So that means this is just the way it is. So it's very light aluminum stuff. Do not over torque this like you would. Not that you'd over torque any drain plug, but use a torque wrench if you're a bit more scared of your abilities. 20 foot pounds. If not, just snug it just a hair. Now that turbo pipe is almost in the way, but I'm using probably the maximum here half inch ratchet, reducer, and a deep socket 15. So if you have a short socket 15, it'll be a bit easier for you. Anything longer, you will hit the turbo pipe. Once you start dealing with oil, this is where you switch over from your many use gloves to your nitrile gloves, okay? Now I'm still gonna use the toothed oil filter wrench. I'll show you how I'm gonna put that, situate that in a second. And one tip for oil drain plugs is always keep inwards pressure once you cracked it loose all the way to the last thread and then pull it quickly out and upwards at the same time to get almost no oil on your fingers meaning you can probably use your gloves a little more okay so you can see there's a genuine motorcraft filter on there from Lincoln you want to watch out for that turbo pipe but see how I go in vertically you clamp onto it don't worry about damaging it you're gonna replace it and twist it off a strap wrench would be very hard to get in here with all the stuff that's around there. And that, I guarantee you, Volvo style compressor in the way. All right, so the Ford Lincoln Tex had tightened that on there nicely. Um, so maybe it isn't that sensitive. The, I had to use a cheater bar to crack it loose. Now the interesting part is, I can't zoom in too much here, but it seems like they've put an internal drain plug washer 
on this drain plug which is a very interesting design and it seems like it's durable and it also seems to be holding up and it also is not prone to the quick lube uh, plastic drain washers to dump the oil once they loosen and, and damage trash your car's engine so this is a very clever design by Ford but we'll keep an eye on it and see how good of a drain plug internal built-in non-replaceable washer design this is over time and of course only in a windy parking lot does the the oil drain the opposite way so you have to pull your drain pan forward joys of working in a parking lot all right so the castrol filter is just a hair shorter but it's still the same spin-on filter that fits on this car the ford part is FL910S for those of you that want to go to a Ford dealer and save a couple bucks possibly over going to the Lincoln dealer to get your OE oil filter. Just make sure you get the gasket off. Remember that from the old one. Alright so even with very careful removal of the oil filter you can see how the oil will like to run down the oil pan there. So the brake cleaner and the multiple rags I mentioned are definitely a necessity on doing an oil change on this car. In terms of disposal, put the old oil filter with the rubber band in the box for the new one to not dirty your car. More important than all this, I'm focusing on the oil filter housing here. I have now cleaned this with maybe five rounds of brake cleaner and rags. To clear the mating surface of crust and debris buildup on where's my finger oh my god okay on this surface here okay this can be just as bad as a double gasket maybe not just as bad but it can be the source of a minor oil leak okay so clean it clean it up before you put the new filter with the loop gasket on and you can see I've now brake cleaned all of that stuff off just a hair of a rag touch on the drip before you put the drain plug washer back. The Castrol filter fit very well and threaded in. Torque spec is the rag covered power of a decently strong person. No strap wrenches on this, okay? This is a good filter. I did not pre-fill the filter. You can do that if you want, subtract it from your total. Nice Lufthansa 744. How much longer will the 744 grace the skies? So once we get it filled up, I am going to check the oil on this spot as it is flat enough. All right, so I haven't put the belly pan back on. Now it's pretty ridiculous for jack stand people to have to put the car down, fill the oil, pack, pack it back up, pick it back up with the difficulty of this car's jacking procedures. So I'm gonna do it a different way, okay? I filled up about 5.2 liters in here, 5.4 is the capacity. Cars can run on a grade, okay? So this is just a slight grade. I'm going to run the car for about 30 seconds, 35 seconds, just to see if there's any leak from the oil filter or the drain plug. Quickly, I'm going to turn it off, put my belly pan back on, and then do my final fill. The only thing you have to do is not be lazy. Take out, make sure you remember to take out the funnel and put the dipstick back so that the oil system is sealed and the car runs properly during this procedure. Okay, this is one way you can do it. Best way to do it is to drop it, pick it up, drop it, pick it up, but that's your call. Before picking it up, I'm going to come back under as I turn it on. Those little oil spots there, those are just from me doing the work as I removed the old oil. Don't get scared if it makes a little bit of a dry sound because the oil filter is empty at the beginning. All is well.
All right, so our oil filter is dry. And our drain plug is leak free. So now we're gonna put the belly pan, turn off the car, put the belly pan, and put the car down, check the final level, add the couple 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a liter that's left. So push those two plastic guide pin tabs in first. That's the purpose of them. It's to hold it in place while you grab your 10 mils and put them in. So don't break those. It'll make your life easier to have those intact. This belly pan is going to give you an annoyance. Those plastic tabs even fall out. They nice try for it. Maybe give us three or four next time. But there's a lot of bolts, okay? And they all go into plastic threads. So as these cars get older, these belly pans are gonna get more annoying to put on and they fit in plastic grooves and they line up with things back there. So put them all in by hand to a degree and then zip them. Because if you zip two of them, you won't get the front ones in. I've been having this problem. So uh, be very uh, back and forth crisscross motion with these so that you don't damage it and you keep a nice belly pan on your car. Removing jack sands and lowering before rain. Remember, one side at a time, three inches, three inches, three inches, three inches. Turn the handle on one side, catch it, tighten it. Go back on the other side, turn it to the left, catch it, tighten it, until you slowly lower the car gently. The audio's in here, so you know there's no creaking, no damage, nothing. Those points are strong. This was our puckless final on the passenger side. And with a block on the driver's side because this side was more tilted the way I'm putting the camera, the ground, this way. So now I am going to check the oil level, top it off a bit because I told you it's 5.4, I'm probably about 5.1, 5.2. Let the car run, cycle, drive it around a bit, and then we're done. Let's see what the washer fluid problem is once I'm done with the oil change. And in terms of waste oil disposal, I'm just gonna put it right back in the 530 container because it's completely empty, the one, and I'm gonna drop it off at waste disposal and possibly fill up my other one just a bit. And yeah, I'll be right back with you. Another point to take in is AMSOIL's information is incorrect. Turbocharged cars usually take a bit more oil from my experience. We'll get into the Volvo P1T5 stuff because there's a big forum thread that I have there and people saying different things and nobody still knows what amount it really takes but that's for another video. But this is a 2 liter turbo 4 so no different. Um, I, uh, I kept cycling the engine, letting the oil settle, checking, checking, checking. 5.4 is not enough. This car took about 5.8 liters to get it up to about uh, three quarters of the way to seven eighths on the hash marks for the dipstick. So I'm gonna run it one more time, check it again, but I'm not gonna put in the full six liters. It's just under six liters, those two mobile one uh, containers, but I wanna make sure the car has enough oil so the turbo isn't starved. And at this point, the oil filter is completely filled with the amount of cycling I've done. So I'll check it one more time, but uh, use a dipstick, people. I don't know, Amsoil site is not as trustworthy as the dipstick, for me at least. All right, so this is about the fifth time I'm cycling the engine. The, that amount that I told you, it's a bit more. I mean, if you wanna be at the lowest end of the hash marks, yeah, 5.4 cold on level ground is fine. But why would you wanna do that in case the turbo burns a bit of oil? Now the interesting thing, like I said, this car only has 97K. We'll get into the oil life reset soon. But the oil dipstick, had I had to really press on it to clean it the first time, which means turbocharged engines get hot, they get the oil hot. There was slight sludge buildup even on the dipstick, which means this oil needs to be changed frequently on these turbocharged four-cylinder engines if you want them to have a decent life. So I'm going to turn it off, check it one more time, but... Uh, just so you guys know, that 
4.73 liter jug is completely gone and this one is 946 mils so maybe it is 5.5 5.6 liters i'm not going to do the math in milliliters because it's less than five liters actually so it could be closer to 5.4 but out of these two jugs you see right there that's what i have left and i'm about three quarters to seven eighths up on the dipstick so if you do the math maybe it was 5.4 but man i put a lot of information in this video so you should all be good just use a dipstick okay dipstick never lies ball never lies dipstick never lies so while we wait for the final oil level to settle, like I said, could be closer to 5.4. I, I had mistakenly thought that that jug was 5 liters, but it's 4.73 liters. So don't, don't go all crazy here. All right, moving along. The washer fluid. The guy says that the washer fluid does not spray. When I came to spray it, the motor sounds very healthy. Is it just low fluid? I don't know it should have a warning for that but I did not see something like that on the dash let's uh, just put some washer fluid inside and see if it if it squirts that's the first test and then we'll do the oil light reset as well so I'm gonna fill it up now and let's uh, see if the washer fluid nozzles work all right so that's a bit worrying I just put a little bit of washer fluid inside and it completely filled it up so usually this is clogged nozzles let's go try it one more time I'm going to check the oil first and let's continue with the washer fluid. All right, so final level check has us about three quarters of the way up on the hash marks. A beginner novice mistake that is usually made on oil checks is you're going to have oil, very thick film, way up on the dipstick sometimes because dipstick tubes are not very well engineered most of the time and they pick up oil as you go up and down on the dipstick tube this is common to any brand make model of vehicle okay so even if you see oil way up on the dipstick maybe like i don't know a tenth of the width of the dipstick very thick that does not mean you've way overfilled it that just means the dipstick has picked up oil on its way up and down okay so I'm not going to add any more. We're probably somewhere between 5.4 to 5.7 liters on this car. And that's what I would recommend you guys do. But check the dipstick, level ground. I've repeated it a million times. Let's get on with the whole washer fluid thing now. All right, so before this, let's go into the menu here. And all right, turn the radio off. Turn the AC off. Okay. Now, oil reset. How does this car work? One of the funniest things, the first time you get in this car, you won't know how to turn it on because the start stop button is hiding up there. So there's a help for you if it's your first time. Oil change required. Okay. Let's press okay. All right, this car, is, okay. Come on. Okay, I'm pushing the I'm pushing the okay. Come on, zoom in. Okay, that button says okay. The light doesn't pick it up. Fuel accessory power active, full accessory. Okay. Oh okay. I'm pushing the okay button, dude. Come on. Work on me. He work for me here. Alright. That is not doing anything. Um Okay, there's another okay button on the left side of the steering wheel. Okay. Okay, all right. Now that we're in the computer, I'm just using these uh, settings on the steering wheel. Let's go down. This guy with his annoying fart can exhaust on his Toyota. Okay. Driver assist settings. Tune your exhaust nicely. That's a FRS and it sounds like a crap. It sounds like a Camry with an exhaust and it's with the hole in the exhaust. Okay, settings, okay. Vehicle, okay. Scroll down. Oil life, okay. Hold okay to reset and very nice, 100%. This is way nicer than Acura system. All right, so oil stuff is done. Let's just turn on the car here to 
Let's see, make sure all the menus have been cleared up. All right. Let's... There is no exit button, though. I don't understand that. I'm just pushing the back button. All right. Yeah. So that button on the left is kind of like a back button. Now we are nice and smooth, clear, done with the oil change. All right. Washer fluid stuff. Let's see what happens now. So I filled it up a bit. All right, you see, hear the pump? Nothing, we're gonna blow the pump like this. So we'll let go. And now we're gonna go check the nozzles. Now, a little, what's it called, pin or, what do they call it, the sewing people? Needles, I don't know if they're called needles, but something very sharp. If you poke it in there, usually there's a piece of sand or rock in there. But what's concerning is usually when that's the issue, it is, one of the nozzles will be working and the other nozzle will be spraying half acidly okay if that's a word we have nothing working here so this is a bit awkward but next step is to check the nozzles all right so they're very small i can't really zoom in on them all right there's one of them okay there's three of these along underneath the hood cowl there it won't focus can an auto focus but they're very cheap plastic, none of them are clogged. But what I realized, which is why you wanna do the stationary, is right away I've got a big puddle of washer fluid underneath the car, which means that a hose is disconnected somewhere. So let's see if we can do this from the top because I really don't feel like jacking this car back up again. All right, so here's the battery on the driver's side. You can see there's some fresh fluid on the left side of the battery there. I hope I can take these clips off with the tools I have here, which would just be flathead screwdrivers, and we can see under there if the hose has been disconnected, some hose. All right, so all five of those clips came off with that flathead screwdriver there with gentle prying. As these cars age, if you're watching this video years down the road, these things are gonna get more brittle. You gotta be even more careful and remember that this sandwiches a piece of felt firewall protectant underneath, the steel frame, and a piece of plastic on top. So let's keep digging into this. We might have to take off that piece of weather stripping in the center of your screen there to access this properly. This car might get a little leaf cleaning just by luck too. All right guys, so you saw the washer fluid leak on the bottom. And this is also a top tip on knowing when to stop. I'll tell the customer what the problem is and I'm gonna have to come back another day to fix this because I need to remove the wiper arms to get that plastic completely off. But this was enough, okay? Here's where we are, okay, driver's side. I'm gonna lift this up a bit. There's probably terrible lighting and it will not focus. All right, that's as good as it's gonna focus, but believe me when I tell you under there, it's all wet with washer fluid underneath the cowling there. So I'm gonna have to remove the wiper arms, remove this entire piece of plastic that goes across the front, refit those, make sure there's nothing blocking the lines for all three of them, all the way down to the washer fluid reservoir. So if this car's back, we will have a actual washer fluid finishing video. So Lincoln MKZ series, I don't know if it's a series, maybe I'll get one of these later just to continue because this car showed up on the channel. And uh, yeah, I mean this car rips pretty nicely, it's decently weighted. And yeah, I mean it's kind of cool looking car. Okay, bye. Final note, why do I always say use washer fluid containers? Because filling your waste oil, you have a visual reference to not overfill and spill. With those jugs, you will overfill and spill with the amount of attention you have to put into it. So washer fluid containers it is.